We now move to questions for the Minister for Communities. I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Question one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and with your indulgence, um, if I could just, as Minister with responsibility for broadcasting, take this opportunity at the start of question time uh, to pass on my sincere condolences to the family and friends of the late uh, Austin Hunter, who so tragically died at the weekend. And it's clear from the very many tributes uh, that have been received from the political and media worlds. Uh, that Austin was a man of great integrity and highly respected by all who came into contact with him. And I'm sure the whole House will join me in offering their prayers and thoughts to the family at this time. Turning to uh, the question, um, a tripartite funding arrangement exists for the 24-hour domestic and sexual violence helpline. This very valuable service is delivered by Women's Aid Federation Northern Ireland and has been funded by a grant agreement attracting funding from the Department of Health, uh, Department of Justice and the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. The Housing Executive currently funds the helpline uh, with 113,000 per annum, uh, while Department of Justice and Department of Health uh, contribute £110,000 each per annum. Uh, this coming together by the departments uh, to ensure a valuable service survives in an economical, challenging time is the model for future collaborative work. Ms. Boyle for supplementary. Gormogut, um, can I thank the Minister and also just on that note, on behalf of the party too, I would like to send our sincere sympathies to the family of Austin Hunter also. Uh, Minister, um, you would be aware that there are a total of 738 women and 520 children uh, were accommodated in refuges uh, in 2015-16, and thousands more accessed community support. And of that, 267 women could not be accommodated due to the lack of refuge space. Minister, what do you intend to do in terms of supporting uh, women who need refuge? Gormagut. Well, the member raises a very important point. Um, I've met with Women's Aid uh, to talk about uh, the issues that they're actively seeking to address and how government can uh, work with them. Uh, we primarily support Women's Aid uh, to address the issues that the member has highlighted through the Supporting People programme, and that's something uh, that this executive uh, has put £72 uh, million in. Uh, and this year, uh, recognising the pressures that exist for the providers of that scheme, of which Women's Aid uh, is one, uh, I found an additional £3 million uh, to be spent on meeting those needs. The Housing Executive is currently uh, working with the providers and will be contacting them soon as to how that £3 million should be allocated to the providers to help meet the types of needs that the member has raised. I call Ms Joanne Dobson. On behalf of my party, could I also concur with the Minister's sentiments? I was chatting to Austin just a few weeks ago, and um, uh, my heart goes out to his family. Can the Minister update the House on what work the Housing Executive is doing to address issues around domestic and sexual violence, especially when children are involved and new housing is urgently required? Well, obviously, the, the primary way in which the Housing Executive um, and through my department get support uh, in this helpline, uh, which is a vital uh, instrument to be used when people are facing with this difficulty, that they can get the support that they need. And obviously, this 24 hour helpline is very important. Um, and that's why uh, the three departments have been actively engaged uh, to ensure that this can continue. Obviously, we're currently going through the budgetary process. Uh, I, in principle, have said that I want uh, my department's funding to continue. Obviously, it's subject to the necessary finance being made available, but that is something uh, that is important. And whenever they and people come forward, and often that's a very uh, difficult thing to do, that they then get the support that they need in the, the challenging circumstances that they face. And the housing executive uh, will work with individuals to make sure that they get uh, the accommodation and support that they will need. And obviously, women's aid uh, play a very important role in respect of that. Well, Ms. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, the Minister will be aware that an event was held last week in this uh, building. Uh, that Women's Aid had uh, hosted around the White Ribbon uh, event. It was very successful, and I'm sure he will demonstrate his commitment to that. But can I ask the Minister how much funding from his department actually goes towards Women's Aid? 
Um, and again, let, let me support the event that took place um, last week. And, and obviously, raising awareness of these issues is, is vitally important, so that people know that there can be support, and that you don't have to put up with uh, the domestic uh, violence that can be uh, inflicted upon you. Uh, and so, raising awareness around these issues are important. But it's also important that when people do step forward, that they get the support that they need. Uh, and the support that my department provides to Women's Aid. Um, has funded through the Supporting People programme 13 women's aid refugee, refugees uh, at £4,618,810, uh, and that's to help provide housing support in 133 units of accommodation and nine floating support schemes to provide housing support to 1,163 women in their own homes. And so that demonstrates the commitment that I have uh, to supporting women's aid. Uh, I have met with them. Uh, I've also met with uh, Fermanagh Women's Aid in respect of uh, the provision uh, that exists in Fermanagh and in Eskillen. And the First Minister asked me to, to meet with them along with herself, and we discussed a range of issues uh, that we're now seeking to see can we address in Fermanagh uh, some of the issues that women's aid uh, have to deal with. And obviously, uh, that is uh, work that's being progressed by the Housing Executive. Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for his recognition that these services require specialist expertise and knowledge from providers. Can I ask the Minister um, what commitment can he give to repeat revenue support for these organisations rather than short term frustrating funding? Well, there's been no frustrating of funding, so I'm not sure where the member gets that issue from. Uh, in fact, um, this year I identified £3 million. So the Supporting People programme. Uh, was ring fenced in previous years. Uh, that budget was protected, demonstrating the priority that we give to it as an executive. Uh, whilst other parts of this department's budget uh, did have a reduction, supporting people programme didn't. And in fact, uh, having only been in post for six months, um, I met with senior officials. I engaged with the providers, and they said that there were cost pressures. So rather than frustrating funding, I actually allocated them an additional three million pounds, um, and, and that money that uh, the housing executive are now uh, going to be allocating. Obviously. Uh, going forward, there is a budgetary process. I'll be making the case in respect to uh, this issue and a range of issues within uh, my department. But let me assure the House, uh, I've already demonstrated that this is a priority for me and will continue to be so. Well, Ms. Nicola Mullen. Mr. Speaker, um, can I thank the Minister for his very clear commitment to uh, tackling the issue of domestic uh, and sexual violence and to welcome also the um, tripartite arrangement. Uh, can I ask the Minister, given that he's very clear that it's a priority for him, and what discussions has he had with his ministerial colleagues, particularly in health and justice, to ensure that they view this issue equally as a priority when it comes to funding? Well, uh, uh in terms of Department of Health and Department of Justice, both of those departments have committed now to ensuring that funding will be made available for this 24-hour helpline. And again, that demonstrates the three departments collectively working together on this issue, as we do uh, in terms of uh, tackling homelessness. And we recognise, uh, again, within that area, that this is something that we need to be working collectively uh, upon. And that's a, a demonstration of how the executive wants to make sure that we're all pulling in the right direction and that we don't have in, uh, departments doing independent work of each other, but collectively we collaborate. Um, the Supporting People's uh, programme, um, in terms of encouraging collaboration, uh, we're certainly wanting to facilitate that because this is a budget that's under pressure. Um, and there are challenges ahead in the financial environment that we exist. And therefore, we want to ensure that those vulnerable individuals that need that support are getting that support, and where there can be increased collaboration with the providers involved, and if that means that efficiencies can be found around administration costs, for example, that is something that I very much am encouraging, so that the end user in all of this gets the support that they need, and that we don't have a plethora of providers uh, using up administrative costs whenever money could be better spent in terms of the front line, and that's something that we're uh, helping to facilitate uh, with those providers. Mr. Cattle Boyle. Uh, Kirst Everdahl, let us hold question number two, please. The member will be aware that when I took up office as Minister for Communities, I inherited a number of strategies covering a wide range of social inclusion issues, including uh, gender equality. Uh, this is an important issue for our society, uh, and I have been clear from the outset that I want to consider how best to take forward this work in the context of the draft programme for government and the executive draft social strategy. The current consultation 
on the draft programme for government and the planned consultation on the draft social strategy present a valuable opportunity to hear what citizens think about the big issues that impact on our society and, importantly, to take their views on how they wish to see these issues addressed. Uh, I'm committed to getting this right. That takes time. This period of extensive consultation will help inform how I move forward on gender equality. Mr. Boylan, first supplementary. Uh, Gar Margaret, I can quite thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I could thank the Minister for his answer, but could I specifically ask the Minister how we ensure that the needs of the transgender community will be adequately met? Well, in respect to uh, gender issues, everyone will have an opportunity to engage in the consultation process, and I would encourage everybody that has an interest uh, to engage in that. Uh, my department has already been engaging with Section 75 organisations as part of the development uh, of the social strategy, and so everyone needs to engage in this process so that we can collectively uh, provide a framework in which uh, all of these issues uh, can be dealt with in our society. Call Mr. Jonathan Bell. I ask the uh, Minister, are there any plans or developments for a new uh, gender equality strategy? Minister. Well, this year, Mr. Speaker, sees the 40th anniversary of the introduction of sex discrimination law in Northern Ireland, and we've had an executive gender equality strategy in place for the last 10 years, and yet there are still stark examples of gender inequality in our society. For example, there still remains a gender pay gap here. In Northern Ireland. I um, have also noted from the Equality Commission's Expecting Equality investigation that 36 per cent of women participating in the investigation believed that they had been treated unfairly or disadvantaged at work as a result of their pregnancy or having taken maternity leave. Uh, it also revealed that half of the women um, thought that their career opportunities were worse than before their pregnancy. Um, on a slightly more positive note, 48 per cent of survey respondents felt that they had uh, been treated fairly. So that is why I believe that fresh thinking is required and why I am keen to look at this cross-cutting issue in the context of the social strategy, which will go out for consultation in due course. Well, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, how the new strategy will promote the new system of shared parental leave and flexible working introduced by the previous Minister for Employment? In terms of the substance of what is in the, the draft uh, social strategy, the member will know that obviously there is an executive process that uh, we are working through. Uh, before that information will become public. Uh, once it is made available, uh, then these are issues that we will be able to explore further in the consultation process. Question number three has been withdrawn. I call Mr William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number four. Mr Speaker, the Community Halls Capital Grant Scheme um, on the 19th of October uh, was launched at Salters Town Orange Hall in Ballyronan. Um, my department aims to distribute individual grants of up to a maximum uh, of £25,000 towards Community Halls Minor Works. Uh, there is half a million pounds allocated toward uh, this pilot scheme in the current financial year, uh, and I can update the House that currently officials are in the process of assessing in excess of 800 applications. Mr. Humphrey, for supplementary. You, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I uh, also join with the extending sympathy and condolences to Austin Hunter's uh, widow Jean and her family? Uh, Simon and Rachel. Um, can I commend the initiative that the Minister took around community halls? Welcome the response. Indeed, I encourage, encourage many to apply for the scheme. Will the Minister take this opportunity to acknowledge the huge need for investment in our community halls throughout Northern Ireland? Well, I can I thank the Member for his encouragement around the introduction of this scheme. And, uh, I believe that, given the applications that have been received well in excess of 800, has demonstrated that there is a need for investment in community halls because they support uh, the hugely valuable uh, work that is carried out uh, across our community in Northern Ireland. Uh, many halls are dilapidated, and this pilot will reach only a small proportion of the halls that are in uh, the worst uh, condition. And, and so, on the basis of this pilot scheme, uh, this is something that I believe does merit future support in our capital programme in the years ahead, and I intend to bring forward a future programme uh, to allow us to continue to improve community halls and undertake larger projects to raise the standard of community hall uh, facilities. As I indicated in the original uh, response, 
half a million pounds was identified in my department um, in respect of the capital resource that would be involved to fund this pilot scheme. Given the huge uh, response that has come in, uh, this uh, in, in nowhere near uh, will meet uh, the need that has been identified. However, I would hope, uh, and I am now uh, tasking officials in my department uh, to identify if there is additional capital uh, that could be found to try and see if we can do more than what was initially envisaged, and that is a piece of work that I have commissioned my officials to look at. Paul, Ms. Nicola, sorry, Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, can I ask what shared future arrangements are included in the application process for, the, um, for this grant? The application for, for this grant was available to everybody uh, to apply to, irrespective of class, creed, or religion. Call Mr. Harold McKay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number five, please. I plan to bring a draft social strategy to the executive with the intention of having it issued for public consultation subject to executive approval. Uh, the social strategy will be our strategy to promote opportunity, tackle poverty, social exclusion and patterns of deprivation based on objective need as required by Section 28E of the Northern Ireland Act. The most recent poverty figures uh, tell us that 22 per cent of the population in Northern Ireland are living in relative poverty before housing costs. And it's worth noting that over the last decade, and despite significant investment, the overall number of those in poverty remains the same. Uh, we need to reduce poverty and the impact of poverty on people. Uh, the social strategy will set out a new approach. Uh, for example, it will identify those in poverty and outline specific interventions to support them. The strategy will address issues in a more coordinated and structured way, mainstreaming this work into the new programme for government. Our focus is now firmly on delivering better outcomes for people, outcomes that matter most and that can make a real uh, difference. The draft stru uh, social strategy will be subject to public consultation, and I would welcome everyone's views during that important consultation period. Mr. McKay, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer this far. <laughs> can the Minister outline if the social strategy contains robust targets to tackle poverty and what resources will be available to achieve this? Well, clearly, the, the draft social strategy, as I indicated to Mr. Little, is currently going through an executive process to get executive approval, and then it will go out to public consultation. And I can assure members that when they see it, they will see a very detailed plan. Uh, that really seeks to address the causation factors uh, that can drive people into poverty uh, and tailoring specific programs to meet individuals and also to meet areas where there is a need identified to do that. And so this is a very different way of going about uh, the business that government has had in the past in respect of tackling poverty and making sure that those who most need help uh, will get that help to address the issues that drive people into poverty and all of the uh, issues that then uh, are, are caused by people uh, who have to live in poverty. Call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the minister to outline for the House who he consulted with during the development of the social strategy? Well, there was a series of events, Mr. Speaker, that was held to inform uh, the work of the department in supporting the new approach to the programme for government. Uh, these events were well attended by representatives across local and central government, uh, the voluntary and community sector, business community and representatives of Section 75 organisations. All of this has helped inform the work that my department is responsible for under the programme for government, including uh, the development of a draft social strategy. That draft strategy will be subject to public consultation. Commissioner Bradley. Mr Speaker, and can I place on record my apologies for not being in place at the beginning of question time. I would also like to thank the Minister for using the opportunity to express the condolences of this House to Austin Hunter and his family, and I certainly add SDLP to that. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of the social strategy, could he explain the actual delay in bringing it to public consultation and to provide a timeline as to when we will actually see this strategy? Well, let me assure the House that there is no undue delay with the draft programme for government that is out for consultation, but obviously uh, there is the economic investment strategy uh, that is still to go through the executive and paralleled with that is the social strategy. And what we want to make sure is that uh, our economic strategy 
dovetails uh, and is tailored into the social strategy, which is about addressing poverty. Uh, and obviously, that's important that we get that right. Um, and as soon as that process is completed, then we'll be able to move to a public consultation process. Call Ms. Michelle Gilder New. Um, I thank the Minister for his responses thus far. He has talked about going to public consultation and that he wants that to be a full consultation. Can I ask him how he intends to um, consult with harder to reach rural communities? Well, the member raises an important point in respect of rural poverty, and it's been something that we've been looking at in the department, uh, because often areas of deprivation um, is difficult to uh, identify um, where it can be masked around more affluent areas. Uh, and so there are cases where uh, members will all know in their constituencies uh, they don't naturally fit into deprived areas, but in and of themselves very much are deprived. And so tackling rural poverty is something that I think um, is very important and will be reflected in this social strategy. And so uh, when we look at how we identify the needs in our rural communities where poverty is uh, in existence, then it will be important that we engage with those communities, and that's something through the consultation process we will do. It will be publicly available uh, to individuals to uh, be uh, proactive in responding, but we'll also be uh, engaging with communities so that they are able to put forward uh, their perspective around these issues. Call Mr. Oliver McMullen. I can call you and uh, have a share. Question six. Mr. Speaker, the Supporting People programme has been in place since April 2003, and I believe that it continues to provide quality services that help over 18,500 vulnerable people each year to live independently. Supporting people is a priority uh, for my department. I have seen at first hand the excellent work done by supporting people providers and have met a number of vulnerable people who have had their lives turned around by supporting people services. The department carried out a review of the supporting people programme last year. The conclusion was uh, that the programme had achieved its core aims of delivering significant quality of life benefits to those who have received and continue to receive services. The review, however, also identified a number of areas where action is needed to further improve the impact of the programme, its economy and efficiency. Uh, I have ensured that these recommendations are being actively addressed by my officials in partnership with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, Department of Health and with the voluntary and community sector. This work is being monitored, uh, monitored by an implementation steering group that is led by my department and the improvement programme is on track. Call Mr. McMullen for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his, his answer? Can the Minister tell me, does he expect from the introduction of the living wage, will this have a, 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 any impact on a supporting people budget? Well, it's an area that has been raised with me by providers uh, that um, the increasing in the living wage uh, will create a cost pressure for some of those people who are providing the service, uh, and that is going to present a further financial challenge. So, as the needs of individuals are indeed complex um, uh, and are increasing, uh, the pressure is already there in terms of the finances that are available. Um, but with increases in the national living wage, uh, the providers are also highlighting that that is creating a cost pressure. I have sought to try and meet some of those pressures this year uh, by providing an additional £3 million. Uh, but cognizant of the pressures that are going to be on this budget, uh, there has been a review carried out. We have identified uh, where we believe uh, improvements can be made, but all of that has to be carried out in collaboration with the providers uh, that are involved, and, and they are uh, actively involved in that process. Uh, but it is for those individual providers to identify how they uh, can provide their service uh, efficiently, effectively, um, within the, the budgetary framework that I have. And obviously, that process is ongoing, and I won't know the outcome of that until uh, the budget uh, process is completed by the executive. Call Mr. Philip Logan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thanks to the Minister for his answer. Um, will, uh, will the views of supporting people, uh, providers like the one in my constituency, the Lighthouse, be considered prior to the implement implementation of any uh, review recommendations? Thank you. Well, thank the member for that supplementary. And, uh, the department has established the implementation steering group that I referred to in the uh, original response, and that is to drive the implementation of the 13 recommendations. 
That steering group includes representation from the committee representing independent supporting people providers. My department has engaged extensively with the wider supporting people sector throughout the completion of this report and will continue to do so prior to and during implementation. So that voice, uh, Mr. Speaker, is critically um, uh, important. I've met with a number of providers, uh, and I can see that those people, oh, those organisations, and the people within it, uh, many of those that I have met, uh, you can tell, have huge compassion, uh, real drive, and enthusiasm to try and uh, help those people who are uh, incredibly vulnerable. Um, and whenever I was with DePaul and Stella Morris, whenever I was with Mr. Stolford in the hostel um, in the village area, uh, I could see uh, how the benefits of the Supporting People programme uh, is being delivered. Uh, whenever I, ever, I was in uh, Londonderry with the North West Methodist Mission uh, last week, we were officially opening the new refurbished buildings, and I got speaking with uh, some of the individuals who, who get that initial support. Um, and then they are supported to, to move on into further independent living while still getting some support. And then eventually they are able to move on into the community. So those organisations that get the support from my department through the Supporting People programme, I recognise uh, the huge contribution that they are making, uh, often going beyond uh, the call of duty in respect of uh, individuals who need help, who do have very complex needs. Uh, and they're achieving results. So it's vitally important as we move forward on this that the voice of those providers are very much part of their process, and it will be. Well, Ms. Jenny Palm. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister thus far for his, question, uh, his answers to the questions? Can the Minister outline what engagement his department has had with the Health Minister and her officials to assess whether the Supporting People programme, as outlined in the Northern Ireland Housing Executive's housing related support strategy, has met the Bamford review related targets? Well, I'm happy to take up the individual area that the member has highlighted, but if I can reassure the member that um, I met with uh, Minister O'Neill and, and Minister Sugden uh, in terms of the inter-ministerial uh, group that exists to tackle homelessness, um, and very much the three departments are proactively engaged in seeking to address that. There would be a new homelessness strategy that I would hope the housing executive is responsible for and will be out for public consultation soon. There is a statutory requirement for a new homelessness strategy uh, to be put in place uh, in, in April of next year. Uh, and uh, in preparation for that, uh, my department has been leading in having focused groups of officials coming together from a range of departments and organisations to ensure that uh, when the new strategy is put in place, uh, that everybody is very clear as to their responsibilities uh, for implementing that so that we can have uh, a successful conclusion to that particular strategy. And I know that this is Homelessness uh, Week. We've been uh, raising the awareness of this issue. Uh, and we as an executive very much are committed to making this a priority uh, to, to really deal with, because uh, people who find themselves in these circumstances often have underlying needs uh, which require a range of organisations to work together to meet those needs, to give them the support uh, to be able to help them uh, have their own home uh, and to be able to live in those homes independently. Well, Ms. Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his um, answers. Supporting people have <clears throat> presented a very compelling case, uh, independently verified um, that their uh, budget is effectively a preventative spend, that the problems that they tackle um, would cost public services a lot more if, if they didn't make their intervention. In that context, and the fact that um, demand for their intervention uh, is, is rising, can the Minister assure us that that service will be protected and will be allowed to meet that demand? Well, I, I agree with the member um, because the prevention that uh, is provided through Supporting People programme often can help individuals um, in terms of not requiring assistance if they hadn't got it through Supporting People, and it is much more expensive uh, to get those public services um, as opposed to getting the intervention that comes through the Supporting People programme. That's why I've identified uh, this area within my budget as one that I certainly give a priority to. Uh, I'm making the case in respect of discussions with the Finance Minister around areas within my department that I believe does need to be protected. Uh, this is one such area. Um, it has been protected in the past um, in respect of uh, its 
uh, parallel that you can draw with the Department of Health, and I'm certainly putting the case forward uh, that for the next year's budget uh, that it should get that protection. That's obviously something that will be subject to the Minister for Finance's consideration and the collective executive uh, whenever we come to agreeing the budget, but this is a, a priority for me. A brief question for Mr Lunn and a brief response from the Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, could, could I ask the Minister, you mentioned the £3 million injection of funds this year. But prior to this, the, the supporting people's fund was, was, uh, wasn't changed for apparently for nine years. It was frozen. So what, what plans do they have to uh, make sure that this situation doesn't arise again so that this very good scheme can continue and to flourish? Well, briefly, brief mis response, briefly, Mr Speaker, um, as indicated before, um, this was a budget that was protected. So whilst other, part, other areas of the department's budget was reducing in line with the reductions across the department, this one wasn't, um, and that was because of the priority we attached to it. Uh, and obviously there is going to be financial challenges ahead. That's why it's important that there is collaboration. I addressed at a conference the providers and indicated there needs to be greater collaboration amongst the providers so that we can ensure the most effective and efficient uh, systems are in place to help those people that need it in the context of financial difficulties and challenges that lie ahead. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr Daniel McCrossan. Mr McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his questions or for his answers so far. Can the Minister provide us with an update of the future of the Jobs and Benefits Office and its staff in OMA, please? Well, I'll be meeting with um, representatives from Fermanagh and OMA uh, District Council. Uh, I think it's at half past four and uh, later on today. Uh, obviously, um, I've made it clear that I, I want to ensure that we uh, provide services right across Northern Ireland. Uh, that's something that I believe is important, that we don't just have a Belfast-centric approach uh, to providing these services. Uh, I've been able to make positive changes uh, for Armagh, for example, that was losing services, um, and we've been able to have additional jobs uh, brought to Northern Ireland through the Department of Work of Pensions. Uh, and again, uh, that is something where I'll be meeting with the Minister uh, for State at Westminster uh, next Monday um, to explore further opportunities uh, to see if there's any more work that Northern Ireland can be doing. And of course, uh, OMA is making the case that it is an area that needs to have services provided to that. I'm very mindful of the case that has been put forward by elected representatives. Mr. McCrossan, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister outline why the OMA Jobs and Benefits Office did not get the IPCC jobs, considering that it, is already, it already has the t uh, telephony uh, system in place? And does the Minister have concerns that a number of the current employees in OMA fail to get jobs in other offices, which clearly shows that these staff have been disproportionately impacted by the punitive welfare cuts and the rationalisation of the welfare state? Well, um, obviously the, the telephony side of, of OMA is something which... Uh, is an asset to it and, and places it well uh, should there be opportunities in the future, and that's something that I'm actively uh, looking at. Uh, but in terms of the whole welfare reform process, we have identified uh, where the key hubs are going to be. Newry, for example, Foyle, Dungannon is going to be a major centre. Uh, all of these are outside of Belfast um, because I'm very keen to make sure that the, uh, the way in which services are delivered are delivered across Northern Ireland. But through any change process, uh, there is going to be change. Uh, and even in the absence of the welfare reform agenda that is taking place, uh, there is al always a normal cycle of assessment in terms of the caseloads that exist within uh, these offices. And as that changes, the staff complement has changed as well. So I appreciate that this is a time of change uh, in how these services are being delivered. But ultimately, uh, it's important that we respond to the changes that are coming uh, and that we provide the most effective and efficient service possible. Because what I know from listening to other ministers is that they're facing pressures in the Department of Health, in the Department of Education. I'm facing pressures upon my budget across a whole plethora of areas. And I want to ensure that the administration costs are to the minimum uh, and that we maximise what we can achieve on the front line. And so services will be delivered um, on the best possible practice that we have to, to maximise all of those. Question number two has been withdrawn. I call Mrs Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, what consultation did the Minister have with the Northern Ireland Local Government Association before announcing that he would not be devolving regeneration and community development powers to local councils in this mandate? Well, I've uh, met with NILGA, 
uh, with the National Association of Councillors. I meet with uh, the representatives of the 11 councils through the partnership panel. And in all of those engagements, uh, the issue around regeneration powers has been raised. Uh, and again, in all of them, a decision was sought. Uh, I indicated to members that I would be uh, considering uh, the, the issue of regeneration powers in the context of my new department. I, I, I outlined in uh, detail the rationale uh, for the decision that was taken. Uh, having now made that decision, I think it is uh, important that people uh, apply themselves to maximising the opportunities that exist uh, for local government, which very much uh, can uh, be the driving force behind regeneration programmes to take forward their initiatives uh, and working with uh, my department and the executive, uh, we will be able to maximise these benefits uh, for the people that we represent. Ms Palmer, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response so far. Uh, could the Minister confirm whether, in the light of the comments from the Finance Minister, the decision not to devolve these powers was an executive decision or was it a solo run? No. Uh, this is an issue that um, I've been able to clarify uh, with the Minister for Finance, and obviously uh, he, like I, uh, are very keen to make sure that we use the opportunities that we have uh, to regenerate our towns and villages. And so, there's no disagreement in respect uh, of this issue. Uh, the executive is clear that it, w it wants to have our towns and villages uh, regenerated. Uh, local government want to do that, uh, and collectively together, we'll be able to achieve that. Uh, and so. Uh, this is an issue that I know some elected representatives have uh, focused upon, but whenever I've been meeting with community organisations, uh, who I have to say, all of whom when I've met, have said they are delighted that it isn't going to local government and that they uh, wanted it to stay within my department's remit, uh, this is something now that I think people should move on with because the decision has been taken. We've now got uh, the lifetime of this mandate to make sure that we work together because the public do not distinguish between uh, what local government and central government do. What they do want, though, is the job to be done, and collectively we can work together to achieve that. Call Mrs. Emma Little Pengelly. Thank you. The Minister will be aware, and I have raised with him previously, the ongoing challenges within the Holy Lands area, or what is known as the Holy Lands area, in my South Belfast constituency. Repeated anti social behaviour, noise, and littering, particularly by those living in HM homes or houses of uh, multiple occupancy. Can I ask the Minister what assessment he has made of the effectiveness of the HMO legislation to deal with those types of challenges? Mr. Speaker, I know this is an issue that the member um, has had concern with and raised. Uh, before. The new HMO Act 2016 provides for the regulation uh, of HMOs, uh, but is not a way of reducing the number of existing premises. The Department is currently finalising a review of the private rented sector with a view to making changes that strike the best balance between the rights and responsibilities of tenants, landlords and letting agents. Mrs Emma Little-Pengelly for supplementary. I thank the Minister for that answer. I'm sure the Minister will understand the significant uh, amount of pressure that this puts on local residents who have to deal with this week in and week end out, and many of them have raised these concerns with me on a repeated basis. Can I ask the Minister would he give consideration to including a review of the HMO uh, Act as part of that uh, review that he was intending within the Department? Although it's a, re a relatively recent piece of legislation, clearly there are still some issues in terms of enforcement against rogue landlords and those who won't take control of the situation. Well, certainly, Mr. Speaker, the Department um, does engage with Council officials, uh, for example, uh, from Belfast City Council, um, and uh, there is opportunity there for that engagement. And as uh, the Department engages with the Council and uh, listening to what the member has said, where there are gaps, if they are, there are gaps, are identified in terms of the legislation and its effectiveness, well, then that's something that I will want to, to know about and where corrective action can be taken. I'm certainly open uh, to looking at that. Ms. Paula Bradshaw. I ask my question. Can I also extend on behalf of the Alliance Party our thoughts and prayers to the, the family of Austin Hunter at this very difficult time? Um, Minister, um, can I ask what discussions you've had with the IFA, PSNI, NSPCC and other stakeholder bodies to provide localised mechanisms through which historical um, sexual crimes or abuse, sexual crime sexual abuse can be reported in sports clubs um, so that they, they can do it in a, in a local environment? Obviously, Mr Speaker, I'm aware of the issue that's been raised at a national level, and I think it's important that 
um, where people believe that there are issues that they're able to report that. Uh, and that is something that certainly uh, I'm happy to engage with stakeholders around. Uh, to date, uh, there hasn't been anyone who's come forward uh, to indicate that there has been an issue at a local level. However, given the nature of what has happened at a national level, I think it's important that people are alert to that. Uh, it's something that has happened in other walks of life. Uh, and obviously, there has been a response from government uh, to tackle those issues uh, in terms of the importance that child protection is. So that's something that obviously uh, we're alert to. Uh, and as issues emerge, then certainly uh, we would respond. Ms. Bradshaw, first supplementary. Thank you. Um, Minister, have you any plans to allocate additional funding to Sport NI to ensure additional training and safeguarding uh, of children and vulnerable adults can be delivered to coaches and volunteers in clubs across the region? Mr Speaker, um, if the issues emerge as one that requires resource, then obviously I want to hear from those organisations uh, that are involved um, and where there can be support found. Well, certainly, given that the issue uh, which we're talking about, that's something that I would be open to. Um, but what I would want is uh, those individuals and organisations who I do know, having met with a huge number of uh, sporting clubs that are involved in youth activities, their volunteers uh, do work which is vitally important, uh, always with uh, the best intentions. Uh, but in any walk of life, it's important that there are the protections in place because well, where there are young people involved, uh, there will be individuals who will seek uh, to take uh, advantage and opportunity. Uh, and so it's important that organisations do protect themselves in respect to that. Uh, I know that there are robust uh, processes in place when I've met with uh, organisations and youth organisations uh, which are being uh, looked at. Then. Should there be an, uh, an issue that emerges, I'll certainly play my part in supporting those organisations. Question number six has been withdrawn. I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Belfast City Growth Strategy says it's essential that regeneration powers that have been available to other UK cities for decades are devolved to Belfast City Council. Can I ask the Minister to outline the key reasons why he disagrees? Well, Mr Speaker, the reasons in respect of the regeneration powers were laid out in great detail uh, in a statement that was made to this House, of which members of this House had opportunity to ask further questions. That decision has now been taken. Uh, I'm uh, keen to ensure we maximise our regeneration powers, uh, and it will be in the interests of councils as well, uh, of whom I, some I have met recently, uh, who recognise the decision has been taken and now they collectively want together. Uh, and that is something that I'm sure Belfast City Council will want to do. Mr. Little, first supplementary. Okay. Well, one of the Belfast City Council growth strategies key asks to drive economic growth, transform public services, and, and address inequality is a single mechanism for regeneration and placemaking power. So, can I ask the minister, in the absence of the transfer? of such regeneration powers, how he will work with Belfast City Council to deliver on this aim? Well, the relationship that I have with Belfast City Council is a very positive one. I have met with uh, their chief executive and a delegation of councillors, uh, representative of all the political parties. We went through in detail uh, areas where there was mutual interest um, to see development. The Belfast Regenerational Office engages uh, with Belfast City Council. Uh, and so, where there are opportunities to work together, that will happen. Um, and of course, Belfast City Council uh, has received considerable amounts of public funding through the previous Department for Social Development. I've already engaged with the Council in terms of their Streets Ahead project. So, Belfast City Council, when it looks to what uh, Stormont has been providing for it, I don't believe will be able to point uh, to any unfair treatment from any department, uh, and indeed uh, will continue to get the support uh, from the executive uh, to deliver the services for the public. And so, this is an issue where now I think we collectively move on together and focus on getting the regeneration that the public want. Call Mrs. Pam Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, if he is concerned at the perceived lack of recognition uh, by the BBC in their Sports Person of the Year um, shortlisting? Well, just this afternoon, before I come into question time, we were able to recognise uh, Jonathan Ray, back-to-back uh, -back world motorbike champion. Uh, phenomenal success. Only four individuals have ever achieved that. Now he is working towards getting three in a row, which would be uh, the first time. And yet, someone of that calibre uh, wasn't uh, represented uh, by uh, the BBC Sports Awards. 
Uh, and in this Olympic year, which has been part of the rationale for this, where there are Paralympians who are on this list, uh, they weren't able to include Bethany Firth, who happened to be the most decorated uh, Paralympian and indeed UK Olympian, uh, and she wasn't able to make the list. So I have entered into correspondence uh, with uh, the BBC Head of Sport. I have just received a response to that, uh, and obviously I'll consider their response, uh, which I don't believe has been uh, helpful uh, as to the next steps that I wish to take this forward with the BBC. But ultimately, this is a decision uh, for the BBC. But I don't believe uh, that the process that they have in place is either transparent or indeed fair uh, in representing the people of Northern Ireland and the huge success that we have had, not least by Carl Frampton, Jonathan Ray, uh, and Bethany Firth. Time for a brief supplementary and a brief response from the Minister. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his response. I will be brief, um, and obviously those examples of uh, Bethany, Jonathan, and, and indeed Carl Frampton are um, just the type of person that we want to see recognised for their huge achievements in Northern Ireland. What can the Minister do to readdress that balance in his capacity as, as Minister for Communities? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, today we recognised Jonathan Ray. Uh, when the Northern Ireland football team came home from the Euros, uh, it was this department that uh, hosted the homecoming event. Uh, and uh, in terms of the success that, uh, success that we've had uh, of our uh, Olympians and Paralympians, uh, I can inform the House that in January uh, I intend to host a reception here at Parliament Buildings uh, to give the recognition that is deserved uh, to those who have re uh, represented our country. And, and that's something that I'll continue to do uh, to give them the due reward for the success that they have had. Ultimately, the BBC need to answer for themselves, uh, but certainly I'm making the case with the BBC at the highest levels, uh, but this is a decision that they have taken and at this stage are, are standing over. But I'll continue to give uh, the recognition to our uh, Northern Ireland sports stars for the huge success that they have representing our country. Questions to the Minister.